Trance is a digital music trance coverage of South by Southwest 2013. And uh, I'm really happy to be here with Cristalia Garcia, who is uh, the IP fellow and visiting associate professor at the George Washington Law School. So, uh, hi Cristalia, and thanks for being on the show. You're the first uh, uh, lawyer that I have uh, uh, on the show uh, at South by, so uh, it's a first. Yeah, thank you, and uh, very happy to be here. Great, so, you know, we're gonna cover a few things uh, uh, during this talk, and one of the, one of the first things that you know you mentioned when we started emailing was the, the issue of termination termination rights and, and, and how that is evolving in the United States so of course because uh, uh, you know that's where the, a lot of the conversations are taking place uh, so just tell me a little bit a bit about you know generally about what, what's the situation in, in the states uh, in regards to that sure uh, yeah termination rights are, are a real hot topic right now primarily uh, because they this is the first time January 2013 that artists are really able to to make a claim for those rights. Um, termination rights are also a big deal because of the potential consequences they have for uh, record labels uh, and publishing companies and for the possible uh, gains that they present for artists. So termination rights came about um, with the 1976 Copyright Act and basically it was Congress's way of recognizing a disparity between the bargaining power in artists and uh, intermediaries like record labels and music publishers. Um, in other words, uh, you know, the Beach Boys didn't know that they were going to be the Beach Boys, and so they may have taken deal um, on less favorable terms. This termination rights kind of gives them a second bite at the apple, if you will, um, by allowing them to, 35 years later, come back and say, okay, we want our rights back, and they can renegotiate deals with better terms. Yeah. They can take their masters and do with them what they will. They can sell them on their own. So this is kind of what the thing is. And you know, the consequences of that for record labels, although as consumers we often focus on new and upcoming artists, and new releases um, catalog, which is what we call like everything that's not a new release, um, is really for most major record labels upwards of 70% of their revenue. So this is a big deal if they were to start losing out on these things. Um, uh, it's not as simple as all that, and I'm sure there's lots of tricks of on both sides for you know attorneys to to prevent this from happening. But uh, that's kind of the gist of termination rights. And the reason they're becoming a big deal now, like I said, is because this is the first time that we're actually being able to see people claiming them, and it remains to be seen how successful they are. And and if they are successful, what that will mean for uh, contracts going forward. Absolutely. And uh, looking at, for example, uh, you know, the, the issue of like, the length of copyright, for example, is something that every time we come up to the deadline of a copyright, it seems like it's getting extended. So what's the deal on, on, on the legislative side of things uh, for termination rights? And uh, have there been proposals, uh, of course, probably lobbied by, you know, uh, record labels to extend uh, what was uh, the term de deemed from, from that? Um, so the, the the statutory uh, time on termination rights, as I mentioned, is 35 years. Um, that is currently not up for debate, and there aren't any bills that I know of to extend that time. Instead, what intermediary copyright holders like record labels are, are going to do is fight termination rights on a couple of other legal bases. Yeah. One that's probably the most popular that's sort of started now is work for hire, which is just legalese for an employee-employer relationship. Yeah. The termination rights clause in the Copyright uh, Act uh, excludes work for hire from being able to exercise ter termination rights. So if a copyright holder like a record label can show that in fact the musician was an employee in a work for hire situation, they are excluded from termination rights and they won't be able to exercise them. So if they can pull that off and make that argument, that would that would be convenient. Of course, the trick is most musicians aren't employees, right? They're, if anything, more like contractors or freelance workers. They generally don't enjoy a salary or health benefits. Um, so it'll be a little tricky to prove this. Not that record labels haven't tried by actually putting work for higher language in the contracts, um, but the fortunate thing for some artists is that the way that the termination rights section of the statute is drafted says that even if you claim it's a work for hire, the courts can disregard that if they don't think it really is. So, remains to be seen. We really need a test case. We need someone to press for their rights and um, be sued by the labels or, or have the labels resist and then be sued so that we can see what courts are actually going to do with it. It's so early yet we don't have that. And, um, you know, right now we do have people like the Eagles and the Beach Boys, for example, who have filed for their termination rights, but we have labels who have not responded, just radio silence. So we're, we're, we're all kind of, uh, you know, the copyright nerds among us are excited to see if there will be a response. And if if not, will they just peacefully let it go? Will they resist? And then will there be lawsuits? 
unfortunately, I think we need a test case to know yeah. what to do with these. Yeah, and, and, and on that front, you know, you're talking about test case, and you, is there, you know, of course, this would be too small a, a number of artists to make to make for a class class lawsuit. Uh, but is there a way that there could be a, a, a collective uh, of artists that maybe are with the same label that could bundle together to maybe share on the, on the expenses of what could be a fairly costly battle? Or do you think it has to be like a one-to-one -one situation where one artist goes against, against the label? Well, um, there can always be a, a small collective class action. I think you're, you make a really good point, which is that uh, litigation is costly and expensive. And so the average Joe Schmo artist won't have any incentive to, to press against a record label who's resisting for his termination rights, least of all because the money that they'll get back won't, simply won't justify the expense they'd have to spend on litigation. Um, it will probably need to be an Eagles, for example, who really has enough to gain to justify the expense and um, just go at it one to one. Um, you know, if for some reason uh, the the Eagles and the say the Beach Boys wanted to team up and press it together, they could. But the concern, of course, would be that they're arguing against different labels and the contracts are drafted a little differently. So in the end, I think this will come down as a one to one superstar artist against large label, and let the courts kind of give us some guidance so everyone else will know where they stand. It was a bit like the Eminem with the Universal case, where there were the, the debate on the. On the on the royalties for digital, whether they were a sync or whether they were uh, a natural license, uh, and, and and that kind of spurred on more artists once he he managed to get a settlement from that exactly. to actually and go and try like an M and M to say like, hey, I want these back, and then other then what happens is the court determines, you know, gives us an outcome that sets a precedent, and at that point, all other artists who couldn't have afforded the litigation can now come and enjoy the fruits of whatever that result is. Um, I think we're going to get some resistance. However, I think that the labels are going to try their darndest, um, understandably, and, and artists too, to just renegotiate the deals and say, okay, fine, let's just renegotiate um, without going to court. Because, you know, once you get the declaration from the court, that's what it is. You know, you can appeal until you get to the Supreme Court, but, you know, God forbid they say, like, yeah, take them. You know, then the, the labels are stuck or they go the other direction and the artists get, feel like they're getting screwed. So I think both parties are going to be a little resistant to get a final word on this. Um, I'll keep my fingers crossed, but... And I mean, yeah, in a sense, it almost it almost makes sense to look at it as a way to renegotiate for a more favorable deal, or to take the tracks and take them to another label. Just to, just in the sense that you know, if you're talking about artists that have tracks out for more than 35 years, uh, you're talking about relatively you know old artists, you know, you know, in their probably 50s or 60s or 70s, and at that point, it becomes uh, that much harder. Uh, to take those tracks and actually sell them yourself. So in any case, you're going to need an outlet for the music. Uh, so in any case, at some point, some sort of label is going to have to come back into into place to to, to work on those. Uh, well, it's super interesting. Anyway, uh, it's it's uh, something that yeah, that I'm surprised actually there wasn't a bill that was proposed last year at the last minute to try and try and extend these terms. But you know, it's not too late. We might get it's not too late. late. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not yet. Uh, and so yeah, another issue that, that you're really concerned with and, and you work on are, are is the issue of tra transformative works. And uh, these days, you know, it's uh, it's literally the you know it's it's a, a land of transformative works. You know, if you just look on YouTube or what's happening out there, you know, it's it's really hard to control what happens to your copyright once it goes out in the wild. So you know, just a general overview on on what's the current situation with, with that and, 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 and what's happening on the, on the front legal in the U.S. Yeah, the transformative rights are everywhere, um, especially in the age of social media where, you know, music is so readily available and it is ready in a digital format and technology allows us to manipulate that and, and change it as we see, whether it be some sort of a viral clip, an animated GIF that has a three-second clip of music in it, an actual remix, uh, mashups, uh, sampling for people who are just bedroom artists, right? So there's a lot of that. Um, the Copyright laws, um, obviously in 1976, when the latest version of most of these were done, there now there have been updates, 95, 98, but even so, like 98, you know, even some um, uh, revisions to the DMCA 2002, this is still like ancient history now in 2013, um, but they've accounted to say, you know, we have section 115, uh, which is basically the compulsory license to cover songs, um, but we've seen, and the most recent um, thing in the news was Glee and Jonathan Colton, right? Yeah. So this kind of shows the whole transformative rights and how 
they aren't really treated exactly like original artists, even if they have brought something to the table, making them derivative instead of transformative. Um, so in that case, as, as, as many of your viewers will undoubtedly have seen, Jonathan Colton, who's an independent musician, uh, got a compulsory license, which means he can just get the license under Section 115 to do a cover of uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back. Yeah. He did a romantic serenade version of it. Um, Glee, the popular television show, although Jonathan Colton got the license to do the cover, what he didn't get and what's required separately, and many artists don't recognize this, their management and lawyers may not you know, tell them, is that in order to get a copyright on the cover that they've got, they then need to get a different separate permission from the original copyright holder to copyright their cover. That's what Jonathan Colton didn't have. And that's what allowed Fox and the Glee program to take his cover verbatim, not only use it on the show without paying, but then go so far as to copyright it themselves and sell it on iTunes. And so that's what happened. Um, well, it remains to be seen, legally, what they sort of work out amongst themselves. But I think what this highlights is the lack of protection that we have for derivative works. Um, because, you know, A, many artists don't know that they need the separate permission to get a copyright on it. And B, that they need permission at all. You know, they've created this new work and the original artist can say, nah, I don't like it, you can't have it, right? Um, and then they'd have to resort to, um, you know, fair use under Section 107 and, you know, try to get some free speech, you know, arguments going, such as a parody, for example. Um, but that's a, a very different road to travel down, and that's not what most... Uh, most mashups and remixes are about a parody or a criticism that would allow fair use under 107 would be a critique of the work. Most mashups and remixes are a fan, you know, paying tribute to it, saying, I really love this and here's what I've done. Um, ironically, our law protects critiques and things that make fun of something, but don't protect fans who are actually uh, trying to pay homage to something. So yeah. maybe something we need to work on. So the process for somebody that's doing a, a cover, at least in the US, would be to, to get a compulsory license once they do the cover, but then if the cover starts getting traction, is, 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 if it's particularly original, they should probably pursue trying to get this second type of permission. It's probably harder to obtain because it's not compulsory. Right. I might even argue to try to get that secondary permission, whether or not it's gained traction, because you know, you, know, you, know. you may you may want to get it before it gains traction. Otherwise, the artist is going to want even a bigger cut because those are individually negotiated. So they're going to want some sort of share of the royalties, which I which I agree with. By the way, I think the original artist should continue to get some sort of a resale royalty, if you will. Um, but the fact that it's a secondary license and that most people don't know they need to get it is, in my opinion, a bit problematic. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, one good, I mean, I, I guess uh, one good step in, in, in the way these things are shaping up, though, is, uh, is YouTube. YouTube is a, is a pretty good story when it comes to transformative works because the, the, there is the opportunity for artists to uh, recover uh, publishing, uh, for example, f uh, and, and get a cut of advertising that is made uh, on uh, derivative works that use their music somehow uh, and get a cut of that. So do you think that's a positive example? Or what's your take on, on the YouTube situation? Um, I think so. Uh, I think what YouTube has sort of done, and you know, um, interestingly, the idea of being able to monetize on content there with the advertising around it came as a concession to many labels and, and publishers and other you know, co co intermediaries. So it shows that they can, they can really wield their power for good as well. Um, I think that it does, although my concern would be that we've seen, even in like music streaming services, this attempt to create a public commons uh, where music is free, but it's just paid through by advertising. It's not panning out. Even the biggest, most successful services in terms of um, subscriber numbers, like Spotify, are not turning profits yet. So it's unclear that a freemium or purely ad-supported rev uh, revenue service is, is going to be the key. Um, and at some point, it might need to be more of a cultural shift where there can be some of that, but fans are also willing to pay for what they want. Given the success of many campaigns on Kickstarter, I think it's arguable that fans will pay for things that they want. Um, again, the further we go down a path of consumer expectations that they don't need to pay, the more difficult it is to turn back and say, oops, now you've got to pay, but you know, it remains to be seen if they're sustainable otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. This point that I wanted to talk, talk about, uh, and, and that is also super interesting, I've talked about it on the show a bunch, uh, you know, every time the story comes up or there's some developments in that, is the, you know, the case of resale rights, and specifically when it, when it it comes to an already redigi and companies that are looking at reselling digital uh, copies of something that you bought and that you want to give away and and that's a huge area a gray area you know redigi is actually expanding into Europe even though they haven't really faced the legal challenges there that, that might come up uh, 
what's your take on and, and this more stories coming up every day about uh, bigger companies, larger companies looking at resale possibilities for, for digital, digital goods. What is the situation on that? I mean, the, there has been, has been really any movement on that, on that lawsuit, uh, or at least that I know of. Uh, it's been like now like over a year and, a yeah, and yeah. there's just no word on it. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the question of whether you can resale a digital good is fascinating. And I think the reason we see that lawsuit and, and, and lawsuits like it stalled is because we absolutely have no idea. Um, so this is where it kind of comes from. There's the doctrine in the law called the, doc the first sale doctrine. And what that is is the doctrine that allows you, if you're the person who, once the, once the owner of the copyright has made the first sale, you, as the owner, can then resell that item. So that's what allowed, for example, you to sell used CDs, right? Um, that's what has allowed libraries to get donations of books and then, and then rent them out because they were first sold to someone and then they can go to someone else. Now, in the world of digital products, this is where it becomes tricky. Um, it's not so clear cut. Um, there is a first sale. You, I can go on iTunes and I can purchase a song. Now I own it. Ray Digi would like to say, oh, we'll wipe it from your hard drive and you give it to us and now you can resell it. And it would seem like, okay, that's great. The complicated part, um, and this is what many consumers don't understand, many artists don't understand, uh, many reporters who are reporting the story don't understand, many of the judges who are sitting on their hands because they don't want to touch this, don't understand, um, is that in the terms of service for many of these things, Amazon, iTunes, you know, you name it, you don't actually buy the songs. You don't own them. You're leasing them, yeah. right? You're borrowing them. And therefore, there was no first sale. So they're not yours to begin with, and you clearly can't resell them. Um, now, logistically, the reasons are obvious, right? Because I could take a CD, I could take an MP3 and burn it to a separate hard drive, then resell it to Ray Digi, right? So these are the concerns. Of course, I guess I could have done that with a CD, um, but it wasn't as easy, so it, it concerned the intermediaries less. Um, but these issues are coming up across the board. There's digital libraries now who are having a lot of trouble. They want to be able to lend ebooks, and of course, the publishers are saying, absolutely not, you know, you can't do that. Um, well, why not? Not. You know, I bought it. Why can't I do it this way? Well, you can imagine because now I can, instead of lending my book to a friend, I can lend it to all my friends, and that that prevents not just one sale, but potentially many, many, many sales. You know, so you can understand both points of the argument, um, but the sentiment, the uh, the justification behind the first sale doctrine, which was to say, I bought it, now I can resell it, um, still exists. So what, what what was Congress's intent in putting that in there, and how can we apply that intent to digital? It's not clear. Um, in the meantime, we do know that other areas of the law, like patent law, for example, have actually gone so far as to, on January 31st, I think it was, um, Amazon got a patent on auto rip, which is the thing where if you buy a CD on Amazon, uh, it automatically creates an MP3 copy of it. Well, this is fascinating. I got an email telling me all these CDs I bought had been auto ripped. Um, they were almost all CDs I bought as gifts for people, so I had ordered them and then sent them off to people, so I don't even own them. Um, but now I do own MP3 versions of them, so there's necessarily two copies. The physical copy I gifted to someone and the copy I now own in my Amazon cloud. Yeah. So, you know, uh, is that unfair? Yeah, sure. Is it copyright infringement? Potentially. Does it fall within the first sale doctrine? Yeah. We don't know. And, and, and that becomes more interesting on the corporate level as well because, uh, I mean, on the music front, I, I talk to a lot of people and a lot of people tell me, you know, what, do you think people are really going to go through the hassle of having to sign on to the service and, you know, having their uh, computer scanned, like, which is quite intrusive, and then they're going to delete their files off their computer and... Yeah, it's quite a long process, and then the savings that the uh, the buyer makes at the other end are not great. So that there's a whole issue of whether this actually is an industry that that is going to take off. But on on the corporate level, like uh, when you talk about software and all that kind of stuff, that becomes a lot more interesting because you, if, if a corporation can resell a thousand cop licenses of the software they bought, then commercially it becomes a lot a lot more interesting. So I guess. I guess that kind of has repercussions in, in that field Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. And, and, and too, like if a company like Amazon can auto-rip CDs of mine without asking me if I want to do it or nor me having to do anything, well, it wasn't intrusive. It didn't scan my computer. They just had a record of my purchases, you know. So now they can, you know, sort of attract me to their cloud and now I might maybe I buy additional cloud storage because they, they've converted all these CDs. I didn't even want them to convert. Like you can imagine the, the corporate possibilities. Um, it's 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 interesting. It's interesting ground. I, I uh, and um, 
And I, and I think too, it will have interesting licensing issues around, especially like I'm thinking in the ebook thing where lending really makes more sense. Uh, it was great having you on the show, and uh, thanks so much for your time. Is there anywhere where people could find uh, some, something more about your work or, or a blog or anything? Definitely. Uh, you, can, uh, you can find more information about me on the George Washington University Law School site, but you can also follow me on Twitter at Christelia, that's K-R-I-S-T-E-L-I-A, and I will, uh, I'm always posting you know, what the latest is in copyright, so if you want to see where the Ray Digi case goes or auto rip or some more on termination rights, uh, please, please check me out. That's great, and I'll be sure to, to get in touch uh, if there's any developments on that so you can come on the show and talk about it. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.